Good morning. This is Ron. It is Monday, July the 2nd. Welcome to Storytime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, this is your host, Ron, the only true conservative in the United States of America, speaking to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. So today I wanted to uh, point out, I've always criticism or criticizing Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity at all, but I am going to be realistic about it. Uh, nobody's wrong all the time, okay? Uh, what, what is the saying that even a blind uh, squirrel finds a, a nut every once in a while, right? So, uh, and I'm going to be fully uh, prepared to uh, dwell on or or highlight the times when Rush Limbaugh and other pundits are right and hit, get it right on the money. So, uh, in that vein, I'm going to read from uh, a broadcast from last week, June 28th, which is Thursday... And um, it's a the topic of the segment. This is from Rush, uh, the Rush Limbaugh app, and the app is basically a uh, you know where he is um, highlighting various things that uh, happened on his show. So, uh, and it called Trump celebrates Foxconn plant in Wisconsin. Rush. This is kind of cool. President Trump is right now, as we speak, in Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin, at the ribbon cutting for the new Foxconn plant there. Foxconn is the Taiwanese company that assembles iPhones in both mainland China and India, a number of other places. And they're opening a plant in Wisconsin. 13,000 jobs will be created. I think they're going to make LCD screens or any number of uh, sized TV sets and iPad size. I don't think they got much to do with iPhone production there, but Trump has just talked about how brilliant a guy Scott Walker is. Scott Walker said this would never have happened. Foxconn, nobody would have ever come to Wisconsin to open this plant, 13,000 new jobs, if it weren't for Donald Trump. And that is undeniably true. So much of what's happened in this country that had not happened before in the modern era, recent years, Trump's making it happen. Now, um, this he hits it right on the button here. Not so much with the accuracy of the story. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and give him uh, that. But uh, because what he did is he announced something positive. Okay, he too many times the pundits get all uh, worked up in trying to refute negative expectations and uh, negative reports by. The news sources, very CNN, MSNBC, etc., and they forget that in the meantime, while these news agencies are trying to tear uh, Donald Trump down, that uh, President Trump is out doing his job for the United States of America, and that he has a lot of accomplishments and a lot of accomplishments worth touting. They also forget that uh, they got to, they're dealing with the morale. Of their supporters, and that constant uh, harping about uh, the Mueller case, for instance, the uh, investigation of Donald Trump for allegedly colluding with the Russians uh, in order to um, steal an election, uh, it gets people down. It gets you depressed. And to listen to that, I don't want to listen to CNN, MSNBC. I don't want to even listen to regular news most of the time because I know I'm going to hear all this garbage, uh, trumped up garbage from the Democrats. So I don't bother with it. And I certainly don't turn on Rush Limbaugh so I can hear more CNN propaganda. So there's way too much of that. Not nearly enough of what he just did. Credit where credit's due. And there's a lot of credit to go to uh, President Trump, lots and lots, and probably even more credit that uh, can go to President Trump than for any other uh, president in modern history um, at this point in their presidency. He has been one productive man. He's gotten a lot done, and uh, he still has uh, uh, a ways to go, yet he has few more items to uh, complete um, the, the wall, notably. But uh, it's so when he does gets things done, he makes his big accomplishments. The on the right, the Rush Limbaugh's of our world need to emphasize it. They need to hammer it home, make sure everybody knows and understands. And they should have, and so should I, every day 
a, a segment of their broadcast is devoted to what did uh, President Trump do right today? OK, or maybe even what did conservatives do right today? What did Republicans do right today? What did they accomplish? And uh, that way you're going to be able to because um, everybody wants to be realistic. If somebody blew it, they blew it. If conservatives uh, in Congress uh, screwed up and didn't get something done, then they screwed up. And, and we need to know that. But uh, we don't want to dwell on particularly something that is uh, politically motivated, not uh, something that has to do with reality, but is, is basically manufactured, uh, such as the uh, Mueller uh, independent, independent counsel probe. Uh, so um, that and um, so what they want you want to do is, again, uh, emphasize those things that are positive, because after all, that's just as realistic as making note of people's uh, mistakes, foibles, and slip-ups. So, uh, bully for Rush Limbaugh for uh, doing this, and I uh, hope that he does this more often. I'd like to see it every day that he has a segment on his broadcast, preferably when he opens the broadcast that includes uh, a positive for the day. Okay, so uh, when I come back, uh, it's going to be, I'm going to get into some Tammy Bruce and uh, some pretty good stuff with there with uh, Tammy Bruce. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome back. And uh, so... The um, last time I'd left it, uh, she was uh, talking, giving some examples about how uh, right and wrong have been, um, has died in this country. And I want to still, I want to read again the last little bit of the paragraph um, of this uh, last section that I read last time. Uh, If you think this debasement of our culture can never really affect you, think again. Today's moral relativism and selfish agendas are moving through the body of our society like a cancer, putting all of us at risk. Because that can't be overemphasized. This is, again, this is Tammy Bruce who understands. She understands that what the left is doing is trying to subvert our culture in order to uh, affect our politics. Too many pundits, Rush, Rush Limbaugh especially, think it goes the other way around. They're wrong. It, it is not politics that affects our culture. It is the other way around. That's why you and I can have a dramatic effect on politics, but, but indirectly by affecting the culture. And we affect the culture by uh, the way we deal with the people around us. So uh, now, so we're going to continue with this, and this little segment here is called The Death of Right and Wrong. Carol Levine, John's mother, confessed to a reporter for the New York Post that she thought she was going to vomit in the courtroom as Hart, upon hearing not guilty, jumped up and shouted, ha, yes, thank you, to the jury. Carol and Gerald Levine are condemned to never seeing John again. Each morning, in her longing for the son who will never come home, Carol dabs a drop of his Pierre Cardin cologne on her right wrist. She even hears his voice, she told the Post reporter, her eyes welling with tears as she imagined him telling her, Mom, go on with your life. That's not much left. Live it. And Montoon Hart, courtesy of a culture that is furiously erasing the concepts of right and wrong, he is free, not even on parole, where he would be watched. He is free among many people of whom whom are probably, like John Levine, willing to extend a helping hand to those in need. Many of them probably have ATM cards and remain ignorant of the killer who lives among them, placing them and their children at risk, at a risk they cannot even fathom. The depravity of the story comes not only from Arthur and Hart, but also from the jury that could not or would not distinguish right from wrong. Where did this breakdown occur? How have our cultural mores and ethics deteriorated to the point where confessed murderers are allowed to go free? Certainly injustices have existed for centuries in the United States and millennia in the rest of the world. As a strict defender of the Constitution, I do not want to see our rights infringed upon by cruel and unusual or by shoddy, deceptive police work. Nor am I one, believe me, to hark back to the days when men were men and women were in the kitchen. 
but I can't help thinking there was an element in those days that created a certain trustworthiness, a certain stability. In recent decades, in all walks of life, it seems that our society has been hurtling down a slippery slope of selfishness, immorality, and cultural laziness. Enron, the Catholic Church, the Clinton White House, these are the just uh, grander instances of the kind of poor judgment and willful self-indulgence witnessed every day on the freeway, at the local diner, around the water cooler. So how did we arrive at the state we're in? To help explain, let me offer another story. And just before she gets to that, I, I wanted to note again, she gets it. She's talking again about our society and our culture and how important it is for uh, for that for the conservatives, true conservatives, to win the battle over our culture. Uh, she she uh, I talk about it being you know with your coworkers, your neighbors, and being at the soccer field and in the grocery store. And she talks about it being um, witnessed every day at the diner and uh, on the freeway, the diner and around the water cooler. But it's basically the same idea. This is where you and I can have maximum impact with our coworkers, with our relatives, with our friends, uh, and with the, the people that we run into at uh, various places uh, each and every day. Back to the story. Killer is hero. In the early morning hours of December 9, 1981, Philadelphia police officer Daniel Faulkner stopped, stopped one William Cook because he was driving the wrong way on a one-way street with his lights off. Before Faulkner got out of his patrol car, he called for a police wagon to back him up. When the reinforcements arrived, they found Cook's brother, former Black Panther Mumia Abu-Jamal, born Wesley Cook, lying in the street, wounded, with his shoulder holster empty. A gun registered to him was a few feet away, with five empty chambers. Police would later learn that Abu-Jamal had not arrived on the scene with his brother. He was sitting in the, his cab across the street when Faulkner pu pulled Cook over. Uh, Faulkner also lay on the street, dying from five bullet wounds, one of which was to his back. Three witnesses specifically identified Abu Jamal as the man who fired all the shots at Faulkner and testified that once Faulkner was down, Abu Jamal stood over him and unloaded more shots directly into his groin and head. At the hospital, Daniel Faulkner lay on a gurney in the emergency room as doctors and nurses worked in vain to revive him. Abu Jamal was brought to the same hospital, kicking, screaming, and cursing. During his trial, hospital security guard Priscilla Durham testified that she was standing just a few inches from him and that as he struggled on the floor with hospital workers and police, he cursed Faulkner and said he hoped his victim would die. Abu Jamal was evidently or eventually found guilty after courtroom antics that included fighting with the judge and making political speeches. With overwhelming evidence against him and because of the special circumstances of killing a police officer on duty during the penalty phase, the jury of ten whites and two blacks deliberated for less than two hours and came back with a sentence of death. So far, our, system, our justice system seemed to be working. Yes, we lost a good man that winter day in Philadelphia, but his murderer was where he belonged, on death row. But of course, in our world of growing and moral relativism, that could not remain the case. Mumia Abu Jamal, instead of being regarded as the criminal he is, has become a cause celeb for the left, a martyred idealist, if you will. And before I go on to the next section, I did want to comment. She refers to moral relativism, and there is a theory, a formal theory called scientific value relativism. And the way it works is like this. If you See that somebody is a student. They're studying. Uh, they've informed you they go to school. You can uh, you can not say what it is that they should be doing. That there is no uh, scientific or logical basis to make the statement to make a statement as to what it is that um, student should do. And uh, so and that then that goes for everybody, whether you're a police officer or um, construction worker, whatever. That there is no there are no norms for people. Uh, this is baloney. The fact of the matter is that, uh, yes, we can tell this student what it is that he or she should be doing because she's a student. So she should be studying. It's just that simple. It is called. Um, 
a, uh, well, I was going to say prima facie, but it's really uh, axiomatic. It's something that you is obvious. You see, and, and reality is axiomatic, for instance. Now, the left denies axioms. They say they don't exist, that they are a fiction that are created by capitalists to, to use to oppress people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they offer, of course, no evidence that any of that exists. They just expect everybody to take their word for it. So, uh, but I just wanted to interject as to exactly what she means by uh, relativism. When she says relativism, she's talking about scientific value relativism. Years of the Beast. The drumbeat to Free Mumia began almost immediately after his sentencing. By 1994, it was a favorite slogan for fashionable leftists. With the assistance of international television, the Mumia craze swept the world. Time reported his supporters' contention that the real killer had been spotted running from the scene. National Public Radio signed Abu Abu Jamal to do reports on prison life from behind bars, although the network canceled the contract in response to overwhelming public pressure. Leonard Weinglass, the leftist attorney who was handling Abu Jamal's appeal and who had entered the national spotlight by defending the Chicago 7 and Patty Hearst's kidnappers, rounded up a herd of celebrities for the cause, including Pullman, Susan Sarandon, Ed Asner, and Ossie Davis. And I recognize Ed Asner and Ossie Davis, uh, and I think Susan Sarandon, too, as being, again, socialists. Uh, they're always involved in um, expressing um, favor for and support for socialist causes and socialist individuals. Paul Newman, I didn't uh, recognize as being um, a lefty uh, to, to the same degree as the other three. In 2000, the city of Paris, France, in all its anti-American socialistic glory, made Abu Jamal an honorary citizen, a status last accorded to Pablo Picasso in 1971. There have been protests supporting Abu Jamal from uh, Japan to South Africa. Benefit rock concerts have even been held to raise money for him. Also in 2000, Francois Mitterrand's widow, Danielle, visited Abu Jamal in prison. Norman Mailer and Nelson Mandela piped up, contending that Abu Jamal's trial was a miscarriage of justice. Even Amnesty International joined the feast, citing a pattern of events that compromised Abu Jamal's right to a fair trial. Pattern of events? Spare me. The only pattern here was Abu Jamal pulling the trigger of his 38 five times in order to murder Daniel Faulkner. As for any sign of repentance after he heard his sentence, Abu Jamal screamed, Judge, you have just sentenced yourself to die. Um, and that's quote unquote. With several deputies pulling him out of the chaotic courtroom, his final words were, quote, you have just convicted yourself and sentenced yourself to death, unquote. Meet the left's ideal man. All this depends on the myth that somehow, some way, Mumia Abu Jamal was railroaded. I know it seems absurd. Even, in, even Abu Jamal's supporters know it's absurd. Consider Stuart Taylor, a journalist for both National Journal and Newsweek, who at least has the guts to weave the obviousness of Abu Jamal's guilt into his support of him. How does he manage this? As the New York Times reported Taylor's artful but morally inane spin, he speculates that some facts suggest the defendant, found wounded at the scene with his legally registered gun lying nearby, might have indeed shot the policeman. But in an unplanned confrontation, possibly involving elements of provocation and self-defense, he might, in other words, be neither guilty nor innocent. Wow. Neither guilty nor innocent. How's that for through the looking glass? That's how the liberals would have our world be. No judgment, no conclusions, no realities, no rules, no personal responsibility, no guilt or innocence, the death of right and wrong. I can't dismiss these liberals as simply confused or stupid. No, I believe the leaders of the free Mumia campaign and especially the black elite know Abu Jamal is guilty in fact. That's their crime, is guilty. In fact, that's their crime. They know this and they embrace it. They not only do not care, they want this type of man to be their people's heroes. For blacks, indeed for all of us, this is the ultimate betrayal of our communities. And um, so she was saying here um, uh, where she got it wrong, neither guilty nor innocent, how's that? Uh, this is how the liberals would have our world be. No judgment, conclusions, reality, rules, or personal responsibility. Baloney. Uh, what they want to do, and again, when you're 
find a situation that seems absurd, the question to ask is not what is the, what the left saying, but what are they doing? And what they're doing here is trying to create social friction, maximum social friction. Um, Abu uh, Mumia Jamal is a he is a committed leftist. He's not one of the useful idiots that you usually run across. He is somebody that knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. He is in the same uh, category as the uh, who is the the guy that um, lived across the street in Chicago, in Chicago suburb from uh, President Obama and um, Bill Ayers. And Bill Ayers was uh, put on trial for, I don't know, a bombing or something, because he used to be with the weathermen or the underground or whatever uh, crappy organization he belonged to. But uh, he was put on trial, and he was also found not guilty. And he walked out of the courtroom and taunted everybody by saying, guilty as sin, free as a bird. And uh, kind of a ha-ha thing. And uh, Abu Jamal was doing the same thing when he got convicted. He got the opportunity then to... uh, Uh, try to uh, use this uh, trial as a way of creating even more social friction. And uh, people around the world, leftists around the world, saw it as an opportunity to try to create a maximum amount of friction, perhaps um, ginning up some violence, uh, perhaps even sparking the international uh, socialist revolution, ushering in socialist paradise, but uh, to no avail. But um, like I said, that's uh, in, in any case, uh, that's what they're trying to do. So, but the thing is, once they get to a socialist situation, like if you look at any socialist country, right? This is my point here. She's saying no judgment, no conclusions, no reality, no rules, no personal responsibilities. Baloney, look at Cuba. Do you think that uh, Cuba has rules? Do you think everybody has responsibilities? Do you think that they have, they have to do they deal with reality, judgment, conclusions, guilt, innocence? Ugh, the, the the Cuban full of political prisoners. The only thing that's going to be different is just what it is that a person is going to be uh, convicted for, uh, why they're going to be put in jail, not whether or not they're going to go to jail. Uh, the only difference is what realities uh, you're going to have to face. So they're as much interested, believe me, in right and wrong and all that good stuff as anyone else. They just want to use, uh, act as though they don't are not interested in it, to use it as friction and as a, a wedge in society to create a, and instigate uh, as much instability as they possibly can in the hopes of uh, creating a revolution and uh, ushering in what they call their socialist uh, paradise, which will end up, of course, being a socialist hell instead. So, uh, And when they get there, though, when they are able to, uh, in their minds, when they're able to get to the, the point where they rule, you can bet your sweet bippy that uh, the trap is going to spring shut. Uh, rules are going to be in place. Um, you know, death to counter-revolutionaries. And uh, people are going to are going to be going into prisons, but they're just not going to go into prison for killing cops. They're going to go into prisons for um, being a traitor to the state, being a traitor to the revolution, that kind of thing. So, um, yes, they uh, definitely believe in right and wrong, only their kind of right and wrong, their rules. Uh, might makes right, the ends justify the means. <clears throat> so. When we come back, I am going to, uh, I want to do, uh, take a look. I don't think I've read from the House and Philosophy book uh, for a while, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And uh, so when we come back, House and Philosophy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, so we're at the House and Philosophy thing. Let's see, uh, where did I leave off? Okay, let me uh, try this. Okay, you could think I'm wrong, but that's no reason to stop thinking. 
Uh, Socrates, 469 to 399 BCE, the first great hero of Western philosophy, was found guilty of corrupting the youth of Athens and not believing in the gods. For his crime, he was committed, condemned to death. In actuality, Socrates was being punished for his habit of questioning others and exposing their ignorance in his search for truth. The jury would have been happy just to have him leave Athens, but Socrates declined that possibility because he knew that his way of life would continue wherever he was. Well, why not just change then? In Plato's dialogue Apology, which describes the trial of Socrates, we hear Socrates utter the famous phrase, the unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates was telling us that he would rather die than give up his lifestyle. Why? What is an examined life anyway? An examined life is one in which you seek the truth. You are curious. You want to understand. You do not just accept ideas because they are popular or traditional. You are not afraid to ask questions. This is the life of the philosopher. The great British philosopher Bertrand Russell described the value of his lifestyle and the value of philosophy in general when he wrote, quote, Philosophy is to be studied not for the sake of any definite answers to its questions, since no definite answers can, as a rule, be known to be true, but rather for the sake of the questions themselves, because these questions enlarge our conception of what is possible, enrich our intellectual imagination, and diminish the dogmatic assurance which closes the mind against speculation." Unquote. Surely House agrees with this. In the episode Resignation, House finally figures out what's killing a young girl, and he tries to tell her. Since this information will not change the fact that she's going to die, she has no interest in hearing what he has to say. Quote, I don't want to hear it, she, unquote, she says. House is incredulous. Quote, this is what's killing you, and you're not interested in what's killing you? Unquote. As her parents make him leave the room, he says, quote, what's the point in living without curiosity? Unquote. Sounds a lot like Socrates. Now, maybe a life of curiosity, the philosopher's life, or the scientist who's interested in knowledge for its own sake, is a valuable life, and maybe it's better than, quote, an unexamined life, unquote. But that hardly means that an unexamined life isn't worth living at all. Why does Socrates think that? And why does House imply that such a life is pointless? And before we go on to that, um, I want to deal with Bertram Russell's uh, quote, uh, philosophy should be studied for the sake of any de definite answers to his, not for the sake of any definite answers to questions, uh, but uh, since no definite answers can as a rule be known to be true, or rather for the sake of the questions themselves, because these questions enlarge our conception, blah, blah, blah. Really what he's talking about here is being skeptical. He's saying that we should study philosophy because philosophy is inherently skeptical, and skepticism is the contradiction that nothing can be known with certainty. And it is a contradiction because when you make that statement, you're making a statement of certainty. Now, if you listen to Bertrand Russell, at least he knows he's contradicting himself. That's why he throws in a qualifier. And the qualifier is as a rule. Okay, he says, um, since no definite answers can, as a rule, be known to be true, which is a, de a definite statement, a definite answer to a question. Uh, what can be known to be true? Well, uh, or can, if somebody asked, uh, can the, uh, definite an answers be known to be true? And he's saying no. Now he tries to qualify it, and he tries to kind of uh, make it um, squishy, you know. In other words, he's trying to suggest that maybe. It says, as a rule. So maybe they can be. So really what he's doing is contradicting himself and... Um, because a contradiction, he's making a statement of certainty, and then he says, but then maybe not. So he's contradicting, contradicting his contradiction. So in short, he's making no sense whatsoever. So the piece is put in here is a waste of time. It's not even worth uh, uh, bothering with. But the point is that when any time somebody is, is telling you, um, here, let's see, the other things that uh, he talks about that are tells, these questions enlarge our conception, uh, or, or questions for the sake of questions, but because they enlarge our conception of what is possible. The whole point of skepticism is possibility thinking. Because you would ask yourself, why? Why would somebody be so stupid as to walk around thinking that, uh, or trying to think, or pretending to think, 
because that's the only thing you can do with the contradiction is pretend to agree with it. Why would they bother to do that, to contradict themselves by saying that nothing can be uh, known with certainty? Well, if nothing can be known with certainty, then anything is possible, including socialist paradise. So um, when anytime you hear people saying about uh, talking about possibilities, generally speaking, they're coming from a, a place of skepticism. Also, you uh, will get it when you hear people ask, tell you, you don't know that. That's one of their favorite skeptics, favorite stunts is when you make a statement of certainty, you want to smoke somebody out and find out whether or not they're a skeptic, make a statement of certainty. Well, we know that the earth is round, okay, or we know whatever it is, or I know, you know, or um, come out and draw a conclusion. So-and-so is guilty. And if they come back and say, well, you don't know that, then you know you're dealing with a skeptic. And um, they're and always dealing with the skeptic. The way to shut them up is with one simple question. Are you sure? And that's that's it. Again, I dealt with a skeptic uh, outside the gym and he was telling me the same things. Uh, well, you don't know that. We can't be sure of anything, really. And then he t- uh, go. Uh, he wanted, didn't want to tell me to shut up. He just said, oh, go drink your coffee. I said, are you sure? Are you sure I've got a cup of coffee? Are you sure I'm even standing here? No answer. You can't have an answer to that. It's contradictory. And the most important thing is don't allow yourself to be intimidated by it. It can shut you up. So people say, well, you don't know that for sure. Maybe this, maybe that, they'll say. Maybe, especially when it comes down to making judgments about other people. So-and-so over there, he's a bum. Well, you don't know that. He might be sick. He might be this. He might be that. And the, always the way to answer it is with certainty. Okay, first of all, you can say, are you sure? Well, no, I'm just saying that it might be. And you say, but it isn't. Okay, uh, Joe Blow over there is a bum. Well, but you don't know that. Yes, I do. I know it with absolute certainty and so do you. But no, he might be sick. No, he isn't. Okay? And when you when you do that and you again, for conservatives, maintain all you have to do is maintain your uh stand your ground. Stand your ground. If you're sure of something, stand your ground. There's no other way the left can assault it. Okay, so um let's see um Well, let's see here. Okay, and back to House. House probably wouldn't put it quite that way. Uh, Remember, he thinks that humanity is overrated. Still, a life where his puzzle-solving skills are put to no good use would be a life he would find incredibly dull and pointless. So, uh, I'm going to stop right there. The next part is called House and the Life of Reason. But I did want to get into the uh, part where um, Mr. Uh, And they call him a... uh, What do they call him? His... uh, a distinguished philosopher. He's no such thing. He's an intellectual midget. He's an intellectual flea. Let's see, where is it? Uh, there, the great British philosopher Bertrand Russell, 1872 to 1970, described the value of his lifestyle and the value of philosophy in general. No, he didn't. What he did was he contradicted himself and ended up with a zero. <clears throat> and shame on the author for not recognizing that. So, okay, so uh, anyways, when I come back, it's going to be time for the New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, we're, I'm going to be reading from a couple of jokes from the New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book by Jim Peach, who is an actual New York City uh, cab driver. Why were the six Polish men pushing the house down the street? They're trying to jumpstart the oil burner. A well-dressed gentleman with a slight Spanish accent got into my taxi one evening. 
when he told me that he was a psychiatrist, I told him my told him that my father is a psychotherapist. Oh, said the man, so you are put together well. I laughed and told him that my father is also a minister. And he said, oh, you are put together very well. I laughed again and said, well, what about you? You're a psychiatrist. You must be put together well. Oh, no, said the man. Shrinks are the worst. Shrinks are held together with scotch tape. There are three big hunters in the jungle in Africa, an American, an Italian, and a Polish man. Suddenly, they're captured by cannibals and brought before the chief. Chief tells them, by tribal custom, I'm required to allow each of you a chance to escape, and I have to give you any weapon of your choice. However, I must warn you, if we catch you, we are going to skin you and make a canoe out of you. Before they even get a chance to get their breath, the chief points to the American and asks, you're first, what do you want? The American says, I want a gun. The chief hands him a gun, and the American takes off into the jungle. Well, pretty soon the gun runs out of bullets, and the natives catch up to him. They shoot him with poison darts, and within five minutes, they skin him and make a canoe out of him. The other two guys see this whole thing happen, and they look at each other. Holy cow, one of them says to the other, what are we going to do? Chief points to the Italian, you're next, what do you want? The Italian says, I want a horse. Chief looks at him and says, well, that's not really a weapon, but if you want a horse, I'll give you a horse. So the Italian rides off into the jungle. However, he's very quickly surrounded by a thousand natives on all sides. And uh, he can't go anywhere. The natives shoot him with poison darts, skin him, and make a canoe out of him. Finally, the chief looks at the Polish guy. What do you want? The Polish guy says, I want a fork. A fork, says the chief. What do you want a fork for? Look, says the Polish guy. You said I could have anything I wanted. Now give me a fork, all right? You'll see. Okay, okay, says the chief. Here's the fork. Immediately, the Polish guy takes the fork and starts stabbing himself all over. Chief stares at him and exclaims, what are you doing? The Polish guy laughs at him. Ha ha, you're not going to make a canoe out of me. Why do Jewish husbands die young? They want to. And on that note, we end another episode of Storytime. And until next time, thank you very much for joining me and have a great day.